Chapter 18. The Party Ponies Invade. One on one, I challenged Luke. What are you afraid of? Luke curled his lip. The soldiers, who were about to kill us, hesitated, waiting for his order. Before he could say anything, Agrius, the bear man, burst onto the deck, leading a flying horse. It was the first pure black pegasus I'd ever seen, with wings like a giant raven. The pegasus mare bucked and whinnied. I could understand her thoughts. She was calling Agrius and Luke some name so bad Chiron would have washed her muzzle out of saddle soap. Sir, Agrius called, dodging a pegasus hoof. Your steed is ready. Luke kept his eyes on me. I told you last summer, Percy, he said. You can't bait me into a fight. And you keep avoiding one, I noticed. Scared your warriors, we'll see you get whipped. Luke glanced at his men and he saw I'd trapped him. If he backed down now, he would look weak. If he fought me, he'd lose valuable time chasing after Clarice. For my part, the best I could hope for was to distract him, giving my friends a chance to escape. If anybody could think of a plan to get them out of there, Annabeth could. On the downside, I knew how good Luke was at sword fighting. I'll kill you quickly, he decided, and raised his weapon. Backbiter was a foot longer than my own sword. Its blade glinted with an evil grey and gold light where the human steel had been melded with celestial bronze. I could almost feel the blade fighting against itself, like two opposing magnets, bound together. I didn't know how the blade had been made, but I sensed a tragedy. Someone had died in the process. Luke whistled to one of his men, who threw him a round lever and bronze shield. He grinned at me wickedly. Luke, Annabeth said, at least give him a shield. Sorry, Annabeth, he said. You bring your own equipment to this party. The shield was a problem. Fighting two-handed with just a sword gives you more power, but fighting one-handed with a shield gives you better defence and versatility. There are more, more moves, more options, more ways to kill. I fought back to Chiron, who told me to stay at camp no matter what and learn to fight. Now I was going to pay for not listening to him. Luke lunged and almost killed me on the first try. His sword went under my arm, slashing through my shirt and grazing my ribs. I jumped back and then counter-attacked with Riptide, but Luke slammed my blade away with his shield. My Percy, Luke chided, you're out of practice. He came at me again with a swipe to the head. I parried, returned with a thrust. He sidestepped easily. The cut on my ribs stung. My heart was racing. When Luke lunged again, I jumped backwards into the swimming pool and felt a surge of strength. I spun underwater, creating a funnel cloud and blasted out of the deep end, straight at Luke's face. The force of the water knocked him down, spluttering and blinded, but before I could strike he rolled aside and was on his feet again. I attacked and sliced off the edge of his shield. That didn't even faze him. He dropped to a crouch and jabbed at my legs. Suddenly my thigh was on fire, with a pain so intense I collapsed. My jeans were ripped above the knee. I was hurt. I didn't know how badly. Luke hacked downwards and I rolled behind a deck chair. I tried to stand, but my leg wouldn't take the weight. Percy! Grover bleated. I rolled again as Luke's sword slashed the deck chair in half, metal pipes and all. I clawed towards the swimming pool, trying hard not to black out. I'd never make it. Luke knew it too. He advanced slowly, smiling. The edge of his sword was tinged with red. One thing I want you to watch before you die, Percy. He looked at the bear man, Araeus, who was still holding Annabeth and Grover by the necks. You can eat your dinner now, Araeus. Bon appetit. <laughs> The bear man lifted my friends and bared his teeth. That's when all Hades broke loose. Whish! A red feathered arrow sprouted from Araeus's mouth. With a surprised look on his hairy face, he crumpled to the deck. Brother! Agrius wailed. He let the Pegasus's reins go slack, just long enough for the black steed to kick him in the head and fly away free over Miami Bay. For a split second, Luke's guards were too stunned to do anything except watch the bear twins' bodies dissolve into smoke. Then there was a wild chorus of war cries and hooves thundering across metal. A dozen centaurs charged out of the main stairwell. Ponies! Tyson cried with delight. My mind had trouble processing everything I saw. Chiron was among the crowd, but his relatives were almost nothing like him. There were centaurs with black Arabian stallion bodies, others with gold palomino coats, others with orange and white spots like paint horses. Some wore brightly coloured t-shirts with day-glow letters that said Party Ponies, South Florida Chapter. Some were armed with bows, some with baseball bats, some with paintball guns. One had his face painted like a Comanche warrior and was waving a large orange, orange styrofoam hand, making a big number one. Another was bare-chested and painted entirely green. A third had googly eye glasses with the eyeballs bouncing around on slinky coils and one of those baseball caps with a soda can and straw attachments on either side. 
They exploded onto the deck with such ferocity and colour that the moment even Luke was stunned. I couldn't tell whether they had come to celebrate or attack. Apparently both. As Luke was raising his sword to rally his troops, a centaur shot a custom-made arrow with a leather boxing glove on the end. It smacked Luke in the face and sent him crashing into the swimming pool. His warriors scattered. I couldn't blame them. Facing the hooves of a rearing stallion is scary enough, but when it's a centaur armed with a bow and whooping it up in a soda-drinking hat, even the bravest warrior would retreat. Come get some, yelled one of the party ponies. They let loose with their paintball guns. A wave of blue and yellow exploded against Luke's warriors, blinding them and splattering them from head to toe. They tried to run only to slip and fall. Kyrin galloped towards Annabeth and Grover, neatly plucked them off the deck and deposited them on his back. I tried to get up, but my wounded leg still felt like it was on fire. Luke was crawling out of the pool. Attack, you fools! He ordered his troops. Somewhere down below deck, a large alarm bell thrummed. I knew any second we would be swamped by Luke's reinforcements. Already, his warriors were getting over their surprise, coming at the centaurs with swords and spears drawn. Tyson slapped half a dozen of them aside, knocking them over the guardrail into Miami Bay. But more warriors were coming up the stairs. Withdraw, brethren, Kyron said. You won't get away with this horse, man, Luke shouted. He raised his sword, but got smacked in the face with another boxing glove arrow and sat down hard in a deck chair. A Palomino centaur hoisted me onto his back. Dude, get your big friend. Tyson, I yelled. Come on. Tyson dropped the two warriors he was about to tie into a knot and jogged after us. He jumped on the centaur's back. Dude, the centaur groaned, almost buckling under Tyson's weight. Do the words low-carb diet mean anything to you? Luke's warriors were organising themselves into a phalanx. By, but by the time they were ready to advance, the centaurs had gall galloped to the edge of the deck and fearlessly jumped the guardrail, as if it were a steeplechase and not ten stories above the ground. I was sure we were going to die. We plummeted towards the docks, but the centaurs hit the tarmac with hardly a jolt and galloped off, whooping and yelling taunts at the Princess Andromeda as we raced into the streets of downtown Miami. I have no idea what the Miamians fought as we galloped by. Streets and buildings began to blur as the centaurs picked up speed. It felt as if space were compacting, as if each centaur step took us miles and miles. In no time we'd left the city behind. We raced through marshy fields of high grass and ponds and stunted trees. Finally, we found ourselves in a trailer park at the edge of a lake. The trailers were all horse trailers, tricked out with televisions and mini refrigerators and mosquito netting. We were in a centaur camp. Dude! said a party pony as he unloaded his gear. Did you see that bear guy? He was all like, whoa, I have an arrow in my mouth. The centaur with the googly eye glasses laughed. That was awesome, head slam. The two centaurs charged at each other full force and knocked heads and then went staggering off in different directions with crazy grins on their faces. Kyra inside, he set Annabeth and Grover down on a picnic blanket next to me. I really wish my cousins wouldn't slam their heads together. They don't have the brain cells to spare. Chiron, I said, still stunned by the fact that he was here. You saved us. He gave me a dry smile. Well now, I couldn't very well let you die, especially since you've cleared my name. But how did you know where we were? Annabeth asked. Advanced planning, my dear. I figured you would wash up near Miami if you made it out of the Sea of Monsters alive. Almost everything strange washes up near Miami. Gee, thanks, Grover mumbled. No, no, Chiron said. I, I didn't mean... Oh, never mind. I am glad to see you, my young satyr. The point is, I was able to eavesdrop on Percy's Iris message and trace the signal. Iris and I have been friends for centuries. I asked her to alert me to any important communications in this area. It then took no effort to convince my cousins to ride to your aid. As you see, centaurs can travel quite fast when we wish to. Distance for us is not the same as distance for humans. I looked over at the campfire, where three party ponies were teaching Tyson to operate a paintball gun. I hoped they knew what they were getting into. So... What now? I asked Chiron. We just let Luke sail away? He's got Kronos aboard that ship, or parts of him anyway. Chiron knelt, carefully folding his front legs underneath him. He opened the medicine pouch on his belt and started to treat my wounds. I'm afraid, Percy, that today has been something of a draw. We didn't have the strength of numbers to take that ship. Luke was not organised enough to pursue us. Nobody won. But we got the fleece, Annabeth said. Clarice is on her way back to camp with it right now. Chiron nodded though he still looked uneasy. You are all true heroes. And as soon as we get Percy fixed up, you must return to Calfblood Hill. The centaurs shall carry you. You're coming too? I asked. 
Oh yes, Percy, I'll be relieved to get home. My brethren here simply do not appreciate Dean Martin's music. Besides, I must have some words with Mr. D. There's the rest of the summer to plan. So, so much training to do. And I want to see... I'm curious about the fleece. I didn't know exactly what he meant, but it made me worried about what Luke had said. I was going to let you take the fleece once I was done with it. Had he just been lying? I'd learned with Kronos there was usually a plan within a plan. The Titan Lord wasn't called the Crooked One for nothing. He had always had ways of getting people to do what he wanted, without them ever realising his true intentions. Over by the campfire, Tyson let loose with his paintball gun. A blue projectile splattered against one of the centaurs, hurling him backwards into the lake. The centaur came up grinning, covered in swamp muck and blue paint, and gave Tyson two thumbs up. Annabeth, Chiron said, perhaps you and Grover would go supervise Tyson and my cousins before they, uh, teach each other too many bad habits? Annabeth met his eyes. Some kind of understanding passed between them. Sure, Chiron, Annabeth said. Come on, goat boy. But I don't like paintball. Yes, you do. She hoisted Grover to his hooves and led him off towards the campfire. Chiron finished bandaging my leg. Percy, I had to talk with Annabeth on the way here. I, I talk about the prophecy. Uh-oh, I thought. It wasn't her fault, I said. I made her tell me. His eyes flickered with irrit irritation. I was sure he was going to chew me out, but then his look turned to weariness. I suppose I could not expect to keep it secret forever. So am I the one in the prophecy? Chiron tucked his bandages back into his pouch. I wish I knew, Percy. You're not yet 16, for now we just, well, we must simply train you as best we can and leave the future to the fates. The fates? I hadn't thought about those old ladies in a long time, but as soon as Chiron mentioned them, something clicked. That's what it meant, I said. Chiron frowned. That's what what meant? Last summer, the omen from the fates, when I saw them snip somebody's life string. I thought it meant I was going to die right away, but it's worse than that. It's got something to do with your prophecy, the death they foretold. It's going to happen when I'm 16. Chiron's tail whisked nervously in the grass. My boy, you can't be sure of that. We don't even know if the prophecy is about you. But there isn't any other half-blood child of the big three that we know of. And Kronos is rising. He's going to destroy Mount Olympus. He will try, Chiron agreed. And Western civilization along with it, if we don't stop him. But we will stop him. You will not be alone in that fight. I knew he was trying to make me feel better, but I remembered what Annabeth had told me. It would come down to one hero, one decision that would save or destroy the West. And I felt sure the fates had been giving me some kind of warning about that. Something terrible was going to happen, either to me or to somebody I was close to. I'm just a kid, Chiron, I said miserably. What good is one lousy hero against something like Kronos? Chiron managed a smile. What good is one lousy hero? Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain said something like that to me once, just before he single-handedly changed the course of your civil war. He pulled an arrow from his quiver and turned the razor-sharp tip so it glinted in the firelight. Celestial bronze, Percy, an immortal weapon. What would happen if you shot this at a human? Nothing, I said. It would pass right through. That's right, he said. Humans don't exist on the same level as the immortals. They can't even be hurt by our weapons. But you, Percy, you are part god, part human. You live in both worlds. You can be harmed by both and you can affect both. That's what makes heroes so special. You carry the hopes of humanity into the realm of the eternal. Monsters never die. They are reborn from the chaos and barbarism that is always bubbling underneath civilization. The very stuff that makes Kronos stronger. They must be defeated again and again, kept at bay. Heroes embody that struggle. You fight the battles humanity must, must win every generation in order to stay human. Do you understand? I, I don't know. You must try, Percy, because whether or not you are the child of the prophecy, Kronos thinks you might be. And after today, he will finally despair of turning you to his side. That is the only reason he hasn't killed you yet. You know, as soon as he's sure he can't use you, he will destroy you. You talk like you know him. Chiron pursed his lips. I do know him. I stared at him. I sometimes forgot just how old Chiron was. Is that why Mr. D blamed you when the tree was poisoned? Why you said some people don't trust you? Indeed. But Chiron, I mean, come on. Why would they think you'd ever betray the camp for Kronos? Chiron's eyes were deep brown, full of thousands of years of sadness. Percy, remember your training. Remember your study of mythology. What is my connection to the Titan Lord? I tried to think, but I'd always got my mythology mixed up. Even now, when it was so real, so important to my own life, I had trouble keeping all the names and facts straight. I shook my head. You were... 
Owe Kronos a favour or something? He spared your life? Percy, Kyrin said, his voice impossibly soft. The Titan, Kronos, is my father. Chapter 19. The chariot race ends with a bang. We arrived in Long Island just after Clarice, thanks to the centaur's travel powers. I rode on Chiron's back, but we didn't talk much, especially not about Kronos. I knew it had been difficult for Chiron to tell me. I didn't want to push him with more questions. I mean, I've met plenty of embarrassing parents, but Kronos, the evil titan lord who wanted to destroy Western civilization, Not the kind of dad you invited to school for career day. When we got to the camp, the centaurs were anxious to meet Dionysus. They'd heard he threw some really wild parties, but they were disappointed. The wine god was in no mood to celebrate as the whole camp gathered at the top of Half-Blood Hill. The camp had been through hard a hard two weeks. The arts and crafts cabin had burned to the ground from attack by Draco Anus, which, as I near as near as I could figure, was Latin for a really big lizard with breath that blows stuff up. The big houses' rooms were overflowing with wounded. The kids in the Apollo cabin, who were the best healers, had been working overtime performing first aid. Everybody looked weary and battered as we crowded around Thalia's tree. The moment Clarice draped the golden fleece over the lowest bough, the moonlight seemed to brighten, turning from grey to liquid silver. A cool breeze rustled in the branches and rippled through the grass, all the way into the valley. Everything came into sharper focus. The glow of the fireflies down in the woods, the smell of the strawberry fields, the sound of the waves on the beach. Gradually, the needles on the pine tree started turning from brown to green. Everybody cheered. It was happening slowly, but there could be no doubt. The fleece's magic was seeping into the tree, filling it with new power and expelling the poison. Chiron ordered a 24-7 guard duty on the hilltop, at least until he could find an appropriate monster to protect the fleece. He said he'd place an ad in Olympus Weekly right, right away. In the meantime, Clarice was carried on her cabin mate's shoulders down to the amphitheatre, where she was honoured with a laurel wreath and a lot of celebrating around the campfire. Nobody gave Annabeth or me a second look. It was as if we'd never left. In a way, I guess that was the best thank you anyone could give us, because if they admitted we'd snuck out of camp to do the quest, they'd have to expel us. And really, I didn't want any more attention. It felt good to be just one of the campers for once. Later that night, as we roasted marshmallows and listened to the Stoll brothers tell us a ghost story about the evil king who was eaten alive by demonic breakfast pastries, Clarice shoved me from behind and whispered in my ear, just because you were cool one time, Jackson. Don't think you're off the hook with Ares. I'm still waiting for the right opportunity to pulverise you. I gave her a grudging smile. What? she demanded. Nothing, I said. Just, uh, good to be home. The next morning, after the party ponies headed back to Florida, Kyron made a surprise announcement. The chariot races would go ahead as scheduled. We'd all figured that they were history, now that Tantalus was gone, but completing them did feel like the right thing to do especially now that Chiron was back and the camp was safe. Tyson wasn't too keen on the idea of getting back in a chariot after our first experience, but he was happy to let me team up, team up with Annabeth. I would drive, Annabeth would defend, and Tyson would act as our pit crew. While I worked with the horses, Tyson fixed up Athena's chariot and added a whole bunch of special modifications. We spent the next two days training like crazy. Annabeth and I agreed that if we won, the prize of no chores for the rest of the month would be split between our two cabins. Since Athena had more campers, they would get most of the time off, which was fine by me. I didn't care about the prize. I just wanted to win. The night before the race, I stayed late at the stables. I was talking to our horses, giving them our final brushing, when somebody right behind me said, Fine animals, horses. Wish I'd thought of them. A middle-aged guy in a postal carrier outfit was leaning against the stable door. He was slim, with curly black hair under his white piff helmet, and he had a mailbag slung over his shoulder. Hermes? I stammered. Hello, Percy. Didn't recognise me without my jogging clothes? Uh, I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to kneel or buy stamps from him or what, and then it occurred to me why he must be here. Oh, listen, Lord Hermes, about Luke. The god arched his eyebrows. Uh, we saw him all right, I said, but you weren't able to talk sense into him? Well... We kind of tried to kill each other in a duel to the death. I see. You tried the uh, diplomatic approach. I'm really sorry. I mean, you gave us those awesome gifts and everything, and I know you wanted Luke to come back, but he's turned bad. Really bad. He said he feels like you abandoned him. I waited for Hermes to get angry. I figured he'd turn me into a hamster or something, and I did not want to spend any more time as a rodent. Instead, he just sighed. 
<sighs> Do you ever feel your father abandoned you, Percy? Oh, man. I wanted to say, only a few hundred times a day. I hadn't spoken to Poseidon since last summer. I'd never even been to his one underwater palace. And then, there was the whole thing with Tyson. No warning, no explanation, just, well, just boom, you have a brother. You'd think that deserved a little heads-up phone call or something. The more I thought about it, the angrier I got. I realised I did want recognition for the quest I'd completed. But not from the other campers. I wanted my dad to say something. To notice me. Hermes readjusted the mailbag on his shoulder. Percy, the hardest part about being a god is that you must often act indirectly. Especially when it comes to your own children. If we were to intervene every time our children had a problem, well, that would only create more problems and more resentment. But I believe if you give it some thought, you will see that Poseidon has been paying attention to you. He has answered your prayers. I can only hope that someday Luke, well, that Luke may realise the same about me. Whether you feel like you su succeeded or not, you reminded Luke who he was. You spoke to him. I tried to kill him. Hermes shrugged. Families are messy. Immortal families are eternally messy. Sometimes the best we can do is to remind each other that we're related, for better or worse, and try to keep the maiming and killing to a minimum. It didn't sound like much of a recipe for the perfect family. Then again, as I thought about my quest, I realised maybe Hermes was right. Poseidon had sent the Hippocampi to help us. He'd given me powers over the sea that I'd never known about before. And there was Tyson. Had Poseidon brought us together on purpose? How many times had Tyson saved my life this summer? In the distance, the conch horn sounded, signalling curfew. You should get to bed, Hermes said. I've helped you get into quite enough trouble this summer already. I really only came to make this delivery. A delivery? I am the messenger of the gods, Percy. He took an electronic signature pad from his mailbag and handed it to me. Sign there, please. I picked up the stylus before realising it was entwined with a pair of tiny green snakes. Ah! 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 I dropped the pad. Ouch, said George. Really, Percy, Martha scolded. Would you want to be dropped on the floor of a horse stable? Oh, uh, uh, sorry. I didn't much like touching snakes, but I picked up the pad and, and the stylus again. Martha and George wriggled under my fingers, forming a kind of pencil grip like the ones my special ed teacher made me use in second grade. Did you bring me a rat? George asked. No, I said. Uh, uh, we didn't find any. What about a guinea pig? George, Martha chided. Don't tease the boy. I signed my name and gave the pad back to Hermes. In exchange, he handed me a sea-blue envelope. My fingers trembled. Even before I opened it, I could tell it was from my father. I could sense his power in the cool blue paper, as if the envelope itself had been folded out of an ocean wave. Good luck tomorrow, Hermes said. Fine team of horses you have there, though you'll excuse me if I root for the Hermes cabin. And don't be too discouraged when you read it, dear, Martha told me. He does have your interests at heart. What do you mean, I asked. Don't mind her, George said, and next time remember, snakes work for tips. Enough, you two, Hermes said. Goodbye, Percy. For now. Small white wings sprouted from his piff helmet. He began to glow, and I knew enough about the gods to avert my eyes before he revealed his true divine form. With a brilliant white flash, he was gone, and I was alone with the horses. I stared at the blue envelope in my hands. It was addressed in strong but elegant handwriting that I'd seen once before on a package Poseidon had sent me last summer. Percy Jackson, care of Camp Halfblood, Farm Road 3.141, Long Island, New York 11954. An actual letter from my father. Maybe he would tell me I'd done a good job getting the fleece. He'd explain about Tyson or apologise for not talking to me sooner. There were so many things that I wanted that letter to say. I opened the envelope and unfolded the paper. Two simple words were printed in the middle of the page. Brace yourself. The next morning, everybody was buzzing about the chariot race, though they kept glancing nervously towards the sky, like they expected to see St Stymphalian birds gathering. None did. It was a beautiful summer day with a blue sky and plenty of sunshine. The camp had started to look the way it should look. The meadows were green and lush, the white columns gleamed on the Greek buildings, dryads played happily in the woods. And I was miserable. I'd been lying awake all night thinking about Poseidon's warning. Brace yourself. I mean, he goes to the trouble of writing a letter, and he writes two words. Martha the snake had told me not to feel disappointed. Maybe Poseidon had a reason for being so vague. Maybe he didn't know exactly what he was warning me about. But he sensed something big was about to happen. Something that could completely knock me off my feet unless I was prepared. It was hard, but I tried to turn my thoughts to the race. 
As Annabeth and I drove onto the track, I couldn't help admiring the work Tyson had done on the Athena chariot. The carriage gleamed with bronze reinforcements. The wheels were realigned with magical suspension, so we glided along with hardly a bump. The rigging for the horses was so perfectly balanced that the team turned at the slightest tug of the reins. Tyson had also made us two javelins, each with three buttons on the shaft. The first button primed the javelin to explode on impact, releasing razor wire that would tangle and shred an opponent's wheels. The second button produced a blunt, but still very painful bronze spearhead designed to knock a driver out of his carriage. The third button brought up a grappling hook that could be used to lock onto any enemy's chariot or push it away. I figured we were in pretty good shape for the race, but Tyson still warned me to be careful. The other chariot teams had plenty of tricks up their togas. Here, he said, just before the race began. He handed me a wristwatch. There wasn't anything special about it, just a white and silver clock face, a black leather strap. But as soon as I saw it, I realised that this was what I'd seen him tinkering on all summer. I didn't usually like to wear watches. Who cared what time it was? But I couldn't say no to Tyson. Thanks, man. I put it on and found it was surprisingly light and comfortable. I could hardly tell I was wearing it. Didn't finish in time for the trip, Tyson mumbled. Sorry, sorry. Hey, man, no big deal. If you need protection in race, he advised, hit the button. Ah, okay. I didn't see how keeping time was going to help her a whole lot, but I was touched that Tyson was concerned. I promised him I'd remember the watch. And, hey, um, Tyson, he looked at me. I wanted to say, well, I tried to figure out how to apologise for getting embarrassed about him before the quest, for telling everyone he wasn't my real brother. It wasn't easy to find the words. I know what you will tell me, Tyson said, looking ashamed. Pison, Poseidon did care for me after all. Uh, well, he sent you to help me. Just what I asked for. I blinked. You asked Poseidon for me? For a friend, Tyson said, twisting his shirt in his hands. Young Cyclopses grow up alone on the streets, learn to make things out of scraps, learn to survive. But that's so cruel. He shook his head earnestly. Makes us appreciate blessings, not be greedy and mean and fat like Polyphemus. But I got scared. Monsters chased me so much, clawed me sometimes. The scars on your back. A tear welled in his eye. Sphinx on 72nd Street, big bully. I play, prayed to daddy for help. Soon the people at Merriweather found me. Met you. Biggest blessing ever. Sorry I said Poseidon was mean. He sent me a brother. I stared at the watch that Tyson had made me. Percy, Annabeth called. Come on. Chiron was at the starting line, ready to blow the conch. Tyson, I said. Go, Tyson said. You will win. I, yeah, okay, big guy. We'll win this one for you. I climbed on board the chariot and got into position, just as Chiron blew the starting signal. The horses knew what to do. We shot down the track so fast I would have fallen out of my out if my arms hadn't been wrapped in the leather reins. Annabeth held on tight to the rail. The wheels glided beautifully. We took the first turn a full chariot length ahead of Clarice, who was busy trying to fight off a javelin attack from the Stoll brothers in the Hermes chariot. We've got him, I yelled, but I spoke too soon. Incoming, Annabeth yelled. She threw her first javelin in grappling hook mode, knocking away a lead-weighted net that would have entangled us both. Apollo's chariot had come up on our flank. Before Annabeth could rearm herself, the Apollo warrior threw a javelin into our right wheel. The javelin shattered, but not before snapping some of our spokes. Our chariot lurched and wobbled. I was sure the wheel would collapse altogether, but we somehow kept going. I urged the horses to keep up the speed. We were now neck and neck with Apollo. Hephaestus was coming up close behind. Ares and Hermes were falling behind, riding side by side as Clarice went sword on javelin with Connor Stoll. If we took one more hit to our wheel, I knew we would capsize. You're mine, the driver from Apollo yelled. He was, in a he was a first year camper. I didn't remember his name, but he sure was confident. Yeah, right, Annabeth yelled back. She picked up her second javelin, a real risk considering we still had one full lap to go, and threw it at the Apollo driver. Her aim was perfect. The javelin grew a heavy spear point just as it caught the driver in the chest, knocking him against his teammate and sending them both toppling out of their chariot in a backward somersault. The horses felt the reins go slack and went crazy, riding straight for the crowd. Campers scrambled for cover as the horses leapt, the corner of the stands and the golden chariot flipped over. The horses galloped back towards their stable, dragging the upside down chariot behind them. I held our own chariot together through the second turn, despite the groaning of the right wheel. We passed the starting line and thundered into our final lap.
The axle creaked and moaned. The wobbling wheel was making us lose speed, even though the horses were responding to my every command, running like a well-oiled machine. The Hephaestus team was still gaining. Beckendorf grinned as he pressed a button on his command console. Steel cables shot out of the front of his mechanical horses, wrapping around our back rail. Our chariot shuddered as Beckendorf's winch system started working, pulling us backwards while Beckendorf pulled himself forward. Annabeth cursed and drew her knife. She hacked at the cables, but they were too thick. Can't cut them, she yelled. The Hephaestus chariot was now dangerously close, their horses about to trample us underfoot. Switch with me, I told Annabeth. Take the reins, but trust me. She pulled herself to the front and grabbed the reins. I turned, trying hard to keep my footing, an uncapped riptide. I slashed down and the cable snapped like kite string. We lurched forward, but Beckendorf's driver just swung his chariot to our left and pulled up next to us. Beckendorf drew his sword. He slashed at Annabeth and I parried the blade away. We were coming up on the last team, on the last turn. We'd never make it. I needed to disable the Hephaestus chariot and get it out of the way, but I had to protect Annabeth too. Just because Beckendorf was a nice guy didn't mean he wouldn't send us both to the infirmary if we let our guard down. We were neck and neck now, Clarice coming up from behind, making up for lost time. See ya, Percy, Beckendorf yelled. Here's a little parting gift. He threw a leather pouch into our chariot. It stuck to the floor immediately and began billowing green smoke. Greek fire, Annabeth yelled. I cursed. I'd heard stories about what Greek fire could do. I refigured we had maybe ten seconds before it exploded. Get rid of it, Annabeth shouted, but I couldn't. Hephaestus's chariot was still alongside, waiting until the last second to make sure their little present blew up. Beckendorf was keeping me busy with his sword. If I let my guard down long enough to deal with the Greek fire, Annabeth would get sliced and we'd crash anyway. I tried to kick the leather pouch away with my foot, but I couldn't. It was stuck fast. Then I remembered the watch. I didn't know how it could help, but I managed to punch the stopwatch button. Instantly, the watch changed. It expanded, the metal rim spiralling outwards like an old-fashioned camera shutter, a leather strap wrapping around my forearm until I was holding a round war shield a metre wide, the inside left leather, the outside polished bronze engraved with designs I didn't even have time to examine. All I knew, Tyson had come through. I raised the shield and Beckendorf's sword clanged against it, his blade shattered. What? he shouted. How? He didn't have time to say more because I knocked him in the chest with my new shield and sent him flying out of his chariot, tumbling in the dirt. I was about to use Riptide to slash at the driver when Annabeth yelled, Percy! The Greek fire was shooting sparks. I shoved the tip of my sword under the leather pouch and flipped it up like a spatula. The firebomb dislodged and flew into the Hephaestus chariot at the driver's feet. He yelped. In a split second, the driver made the right choice. He dived out of the chariot, which careened away and exploded in green flames. The metal horses seemed to short circuit. They turned and dragged the burning wreckage back towards Clarice and the Stoll brothers, who had to swerve to avoid it. Annabeth pulled the reins for the last time, the last turn. I held on. Sure, we would capsize, but somehow she brought us through and spurred the horses across the finish line. The crowd roared. Once the chariot stopped, our friends mobbed us. They started chanting our names, but Annabeth yelled over the noise. Hold up, listen. It wasn't just us. The crowd didn't want to be quiet, but Annabeth made herself heard. We couldn't have done it without somebody else. We couldn't have won the race or got the fleece or saved Grover or anything. We owe our lives to Tyson, Percy's brother, I said, loud enough for everybody to hear. Tyson, my baby brother. Tyson blushed. The crowd cheered. Annabeth planted a kiss on my cheek. The roaring got a lot louder after that. The entire Athena cabin lifted me and Annabeth and Tyson onto their shoulders and carried us towards the winner's platform, where Chiron was waiting to bestow the laurel wreaths. Chapter 20. The Fleece Works Its Magic Too Well That afternoon was one of the happiest I'd ever spent at camp, which maybe goes to show you never know when your world is about to be rocked to pieces. Grover announced... He'd, that he'd be able to spend the rest of the summer with us before resuming his quest for Pan. His bosses at the Council of Cloven Elders were so impressed that he hadn't got himself killed and had cleared the way for future searchers that they granted him a two-month furlough and a new set of reed pipes. The only bad news, Grover insisted on playing those pipes all afternoon long and his musical skills hadn't improved much. He played YMCA and the strawberry plants started going crazy, wrapping around our feet like they were trying to strangle us. I guess I couldn't blame them. 
Grover told me he could dissolve the empathy link between us now that we were face to face. But I told him I'd just as soon keep it if that was okay with him. He put down his reed pipes and stared at me. But if I get in trouble again, you'll be in danger, Percy. You could die. If you get in trouble again, I want to know about it. And I'll come help you again, G-Man. I wouldn't have it any other way. In the end, he agreed not to break the link. He went back to playing YMCA for the strawberry plants. I didn't need an empathy link with the plants to know how they felt about it. Later on, during archery class, Chiron pulled me aside and told me he'd fixed my problems with Merriweather Prep. The school no longer blamed me for destroying their gymnasium. The police were no longer looking for me. How did you manage that? I asked. Chiron's eyes twinkled. I merely suggested that the mortals had seen something different on that day. A furnace explosion that was not your fault. You just said that and, th and they bought it. I manipulated the mist. <laughs> Someday, when you're ready, I'll show you how it's done. You mean I can go back to Merriweather next year? Chiron raised his eyebrows. Oh no, they still expelled you. <laughs> your headmaster, Mr. Bonsai, said you had a, how did he put it, an ungroovy karma that disrupted the school's educational aura. But you're not in any legal trouble, which was a relief to your mother. Oh, and speaking of your mother, he unclipped his cell phone from his quiver and handed it to me. It's high time you called her. The worst part was the beginning. The Percy Jackson, what were you thinking? Do you have any idea how worried I was sneaking off to camp without permission, going on dangerous quests and scaring me half to death part? But finally, she paused to catch her breath. Oh, I'm just glad you're safe. That's the great thing about my mum. She's no good at staying angry. She tries, but it just isn't in her, isn't in her nature. I'm sorry, mum, I told her. I won't scare you again. Don't promise me that, Percy. You know very well it will only get worse. She tried to sound casual about it, but I could tell she was pretty shaken up. I wanted to say something to make her feel better, but I knew she was right. Being a half-blood, I would always be doing things that scared her, and as I got older, the dangers would just get greater. I could come home for a while, I offered. No, no, stay at camp, train, do what you need to do, but you will come home for the next school year. Yes, of course. Uh, if there's any school that will take me. Oh, we'll find something, dear, my mother sighed. Some place where they don't know us yet. As for Tyson, the campers treated him like a hero. I would have been happy to have him as my cabin mate forever, but that evening, as we were sitting on a sand dune overlooking the Long Island Sound, he made an announcement that completely took me by surprise. Dream came from Daddy last night, he said. He wants me to visit. I wondered if he was kidding, but Tyson really didn't know how to kid. Poseidon sent you a dream message. Tyson nodded. Wants me to go to underwater for the rest of the summer. Learn to work at Cyclops's forges. He called it an inter, an in, an intern, an internship. Yes, I let that sink in. I'll admit I felt a little bit jealous. Poseidon had never invited me underwater, but then I thought Tyson was going just like that. When would you leave? I asked. Now, now, like like now, now, now. I stared out at the waves in the Long Island Sound. The water was glistening red in the sunset. I'm happy for you, big guy, I managed. Seriously. Hard to leave my new brother, he said with a tremble in his voice, but I want to make things, weapons for the camp. You will need them. Unfortunately, I knew he was right. The fleece hadn't solved all the camp's problems. Luke was still out there, gathering an army aboard the Princess Andromeda. Kronos was still reforming in his golden coffin. Eventually, we would have to fight them. You'll make the best weapons ever, I told Tyson. I held up my watch proudly. I bet they'll still tell good time too. Tyson sniffled. Brothers, help each other. You're my brother, I said. No doubt about it. He patted me on the back so hard, he almost knocked me down the sand dune, and then he wiped a tear from his cheek and stood to go. Use the shield well. I will, big guy. Save your life some day. The way he said it, so matter of fact, I wondered if the Cyclops' eye of his could see into the future. He headed down to the beach and whistled. Rainbow, the hippocampus, burst out of the waves. I watched the two of them ride off together into the realm of Poseidon. Once they were gone, I looked down at my new wristwatch. I pressed the button and the shield spiralled out to full size. Hammered into the bronze were pictures of ancient Greek style, scenes from our adventures this summer. There was Annabeth slaying a Lystrogonian dodgeball player, me fighting the bronze bulls on Half-Blood Hill, Tyson riding rainbow towards the Princess Andromeda, the CSS Birmingham blasting its cannons at Charybdis. I ran my hand across a picture of Tyson battling the Hydra as he held aloft a box of monster donuts. I couldn't help feeling sad. 
I knew Tyson would have an awesome time under the ocean, but I'd miss everything about him. His fascination with horses, the way he could fix chariots or crumple metal with his bare hands, or tie bad guys into knots. I'd even miss him snoring like an earthquake in the next bunk all night. Hey, Percy. I turned. Annabeth and Grover were standing at the top of the sand dune. I guess maybe I had some sand in my eyes because I was blinking a lot. Tyson, I told them. He had to, uh, we know, Annabeth said softly. Chiron told us. Cyclops forges, Grover shuddered. I hear the cafeteria food there is terrible, like no enchiladas at all. Annabeth held out her hand. Come on, seaweed brain. Time for dinner. We walked back towards the dining pavilion together, just the three of us, like old times. A storm raged that night, but it parted around Camp Halfblood, as storms usually did. Lightning flashed against the horizon, waves pounded the shore, but not a drop fell in our valley. We were protected again, thanks to the fleece, sealed inside our magical borders. Still my dreams were restless. I heard Kronos taunting me from the depths of Tartarus. Polyphemus sits blindly in his cave, young hero, believing he has won a great victory. Are you any less deluded? The titan's cold laughter filled the darkness. Then my dream changed. I was following Tyson to the bottom of the sea, into the court of Poseidon. It was a radiant hall filled with blue light, the floor cobbled with pearls, and there on a throne of coral sat my father, dressed like a simple fisherman in khaki shorts and a sun-bleached t-shirt. I looked up into his tanned, weathered face, his deep green eyes, and he spoke two words. Brace yourself. I woke with a start. There was a banging on the door. Grover flew inside without waiting for permission. Percy, he stammered. A Annabeth, on the hill, she... The look in his eyes told me something was terribly wrong. Annabeth had been on guard duty that night, protecting the fleece. If something had happened. I ripped off the covers, my blood like ice water in my veins. I threw on some clothes while Grover tried to make a complete sentence. But he was too stunned, too out of breath. She, she's, she's lying there. She, just, just lying there. I ran outside and raced across the central yard, Grover right behind me. Dawn was just breaking, but the whole camp seemed to be stirring. Word was spreading. Something huge had happened. A few campers were already making their way towards the hill, satyrs and nymphs and heroes, in a weird, wired mix of armour and pyjamas. I heard the clop of horse hooves, and Chiron galloped up behind us, looking grim. Is it true? he asked Grover. Grover could only nod, his expression dazed. I tried to ask what was going on, but Chiron grabbed me by the arm and effortlessly lifted me onto his back. Together, we thundered up Half-Blood Hill, where a small crowd had started to gather. I expected to see the fleece missing from the pine tree, but it was still there, glittering in the first light of dawn. The storm had broken, and the sky was blood red. Curse the Titan Lord, Chiron said. He tricked us again, given himself another chance to control the prophecy. What do you mean? I asked. The fleece, he said. The fleece did its work too well. We galloped forward, everyone moving out of our way. There at the base of the tree, a girl was lying unconscious. Another girl in Greek armour was kneeling next to her. Blood roared in my ears. I couldn't think straight. Annabeth had been attacked, but why was the fleece still there? The tree itself looked perfectly fine, whole and healthy, suffused with the essence of the golden fleece. It healed the tree, Chiron said, his voice ragged and poison was not the only thing it purged. Then I realised Annabeth wasn't the one lying on the ground. She was the one in armour, kneeling next to the unconscious girl. When Annabeth saw her, she ran to Chiron. It, she, just suddenly there. Her eyes were streaming with tears, but I still didn't understand. I was too freaked out to make sense of it all. I leapt off Chiron's back and ran towards the unconscious girl. Chiron said, Percy, wait. I knelt by her side. She had short black hair and freckles across her nose. She was built like a long-distance runner, lithe and strong, and she wore clothes that were somewhere between punk and goth, a black t-shirt, black tattered jeans, and a leather jacket with badges from a bunch of bands I'd never heard of. She wasn't a camper. I didn't recognise her from any of the cabins, and yet I had the strangest feeling I'd seen her before. It's true, Grover said, panting from his run up the hill. I can't, I can't believe. Nobody else came close to the girl. I put my hand on her forehead. Her skin was cold, but my fingertips tingled as if they were burning. She needs nectar and ambrosia, I said. She was clearly a half-blood. Whether she was a camper or not, I could sense that just from one touch. I didn't understand why everyone was acting so scared. I took her by the shoulders and lifted her into a sitting position, resting her head on my shoulder. Come on, 
I yelled to the others. What's wrong with you people? Let's get into the big house. No one moved, not even Chiron. They were all too stunned. Then the girl took a shaky breath. She coughed and opened her eyes. Her irises were startlingly blue, electric blue. The girl stared at me in bewilderment, shivering and wild-eyed. Who? I'm Percy, I said. You're safe now. Strangest dream. It's okay. Dying. No, I assured her. You're okay. What's your name? That's when I knew, even before she said it. The girl's blue eyes stared into mine, and I understood what the Golden Fleece quest had been about. The poisoning of the tree, everything. Cronus had done it to bring another chess piece into play. Another chance to control the prophecy. Even Chiron, Annabeth and Grover, who should have been celebrating this moment, were too shocked, thinking about what it might mean for the future. And I was holding someone who was destined to be my best friend, or possibly my worst enemy. I... I'm... I'm Thalia, the girl said. Daughter of Zeus. And that is the end of Percy Jackson and the Sea Monsters by Rick Riordan. Hope you enjoyed that one. Thank you for listening.